Jack Stevens, a steel erector, fell off the Caron suspension bridge while working on it. He is now paralysed and has lost the power of speech. There's no hope of recovery. His wife, Carol, acting on behalf of her husband, is suing the Porton Construction Company and is holding out for £35,000 in damages. Tom Morgan, a charge hand and friend of Jack Stevens, has given evidence to say that not only were the men not issued with safety belts, but that after working a 12-hour shift, there was no need for the men to have gone up at all. Counsel for the defence, however, while cross-examining a Dr Mackay, brought to light the fact that just prior to his accident, Jack Stevens had drunk enough alcohol to fail a breathalyser test. In the box now is the defendant, Charles Porton, managing director of the Porton Construction Company, Jack Stevens' employer. During the ten years that you've been managing director, have there been other fatalities or serious accidents? Yes, I'm sorry to say there have. Four killed, three seriously injured. Is this a high mortality figure for your type of business? No, as a matter of fact, it's well below the average for the industry. Below average? So as far as accidents are concerned, your company has a good record? Yes, yes, I suppose it has. Is this pure chance or is there a reason for it? Well, I think, uh, <laughs> well, without wishing to blow my own trumpet, I think it is perhaps because we take a little more care than most companies. I always insist on three things. Firstly, the man must have a high level of competence and experience. Second, we never let them work in really bad weather conditions, ice, that sort of thing. And thirdly? We never take on men over 45. Well, why then, Mr. Porton, did you employ Jack Stevens when he was well over 45? Because I'm afraid he gave his age as 43. What are you saying that he told you that himself, Mr. Porton? Well, not me personally, my lord, but it is recorded in the employment register. Oh, really, my lord? If the defence is seeking to raise fresh allegations of contributory negligence, uh, yes, I think... Yes, I won't so... make any decisions about amending pleadings at this point, but, Mr. Lloyd, I think we ought to have that register produced. Uh, very well, my lord. Had you known Mr. Stevens' correct age, would your company have employed him, Mr. Porton? No, sir. And, of course, this accident would not have taken place. Now, in the February of 1972, a strike took place. What was this about? Oh, just a few minor grievances. Anything to do with safety regulations? No. No, it, it was just a storm on a teacup, really. It's the sort of thing that often happens at any working site. Little things get blown up out of all proportion. No one complained about safety belts not being available? No, sir. For the simple reason that they always were available. Now then, Mr. Porton, it's been stated that on the night of March the 15th, you gave orders that the men should go back to work and link up the bridge. Is this correct? No. No. I see. Well, would you tell the court what did happen while you were at the site on the night? Certainly. I'd been away for a couple of days. I'd been at a meeting all day, and, and uh, I dropped in at the site on my way back. I, I'd been away for the weekend. I wanted to see what progress they'd made. I, I spoke to Walker, my site foreman, and he was the only man I saw while I was there. He told me that they were due to link up the bridge the following day. I mentioned that I'd heard a gale warning on the car radio, but that at the moment the weather seemed reasonable enough. We chatted about technical matters for a couple of minutes, and then I left. But you gave no orders for the men to go back to work? No, sir. And I'm sure you'll find that neither did Mr. Walker. Thank you very much, Mr. Porton. Mr. Porton, you stated earlier that safety belts were always available to the men. Yes. Now, when you first arrived at the site, how long did you stay? Oh, about five, possibly ten minutes at the most. And on this occasion, did you inspect the shed where the safety belts were kept? Well, no. Then you cannot be certain that the shed was indeed open. Well, put like that, no, I suppose I can't, but on previous experience... Oh, well, I'm afraid it won't do you, Mr. Porton, because... Just because a man does a thing one day is not evidence that he'll do it the next. Yes, yes, I do take the point. All I can say is that when I was recalled to the site, the shed where the safety belts were kept was open. And as you arrived there after the accident, you couldn't swear on oath just when it had been opened. Now, uh, you've told my learned friend that your company's accident rate is below average. Now, how do you come by that conclusion? Well, madam, civil engineers have a very simple formula. Experience has shown them that for a contract of one million pounds, it will inevitably result in the death of one man. Two million pounds, two men, so on. And it was on this that you based the statement? Well, yes. Uh, Mr. Porton, this um, formula, was it derived at by scientific study or merely from a general observation? Uh, I'm afraid I don't know, my lord, but I understand that insurance companies take it into account when assessing the risk. 
And then it would seem to have some value. I'm obliged, my lord. Mr. Porton, would you happen to know how much work your company has done in the last ten years? Yes, in sir. in uh, pounds, I mean. As a matter of fact, I do. Our contracts have amounted to almost nine million pounds. That's why I said that our... Uh, the, your mortality rate was below average. Yes. And how much business in the last uh, three years? Oh, it's difficult to say offhand. Uh, well, possibly around three million. Well, am I not correct in saying that the four men who were killed all died in the last three years? Well, yes. But I, I based my statement on a ten-year period. Oh, I'm sure you did. But to quote your own formula, one man dead for every million pounds worth of business. Now, we now find that in your particular company, four men died for three million pounds worth of business, and yet you say that your record is below... Is, um, that your record is above average? Yes, for a ten-year period. Well, I'm sure the court do not need me to point out that when statistics become a movable feast, they can be arranged to prove almost anything. But um, let's proceed, shall we? Now, why did you go to the site on that particular night? Well, it says all right. I already said I, I'd been away for a couple of days, and coming back from the meeting, I had just dropped in. I mean, on the off chance. I, I had to pass it on my way to the hotel. You expected, of course, that the bridge would have been linked up by then? Well, yes. And when you saw it wasn't, were you angry? Angry? Good Lord, no. Not even slightly annoyed? Oh, disappointed, perhaps, and that's all. The, bri the fact that the bridge was at its maximum risk... And that you'd heard a gale warning and this did not worry you? Well, yes. Well, there wasn't much I could do about it. You could have ordered the men up again? I could have done, but I didn't. Was that because you'd already told your site foreman to do it for you? No, madam. The men were neither ordered up by me nor by Mr. Walker. So although there was the possibility that the bridge was in danger, you did nothing? We agreed that there was no immediate danger, but that if the gale got up, he would call me and we would assess the matter then. Did you discuss the meeting you'd had with the road contractors earlier that day, by any chance? I think I may have mentioned a few details, yes. The fact that you were being um, persuaded to speed up progress on the bridge? No, because we weren't. But is it not a fact that on March the 15th, the bridge was behind schedule? A little, perhaps. But with a contract of this size, this is bound to happen from time to time. There are periods when you're ahead. The important thing is to finish on time. And this we did to the day. Are you saying that the building contractors never mentioned the completion date at all? Only in as far as they were a little ahead of schedule and we were a little behind at that time. They wanted reassurance that we'd both finish on time, that's all. Did your contract contain a penalty clause? Most contracts do now. I'm asking about your contract, Mr. Porton. I'm sorry, I thought I'd answered you. Yes, it did. And had your company indemnified itself against a possible loss? I imagine so. We normally do. But did you on this occasion... I usually leave this sort of thing to my accountants. As I say, I imagine that we did, but without looking it up, I couldn't swear to it one way or the other. This contract was very important to you, wasn't it? Yes, of course. Well, I'm sure a contract of this size would be important to any company. Oh, no, no, I didn't say to any company. I said it was important to you. Is it not a fact that in the previous year, your shareholders had tried to vote you out of office because for two years running, the company had shown a loss? Madam... The business world is full of rumours of takeover. Now, this is not an idle rumour, Mr. Porton. It was well reported in the press. In fact, it was suggested that another loss would see you out of office. Absolute nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Well, you did not dismiss the matter so lightly when you wrote to this newspaper on June the 1st, 1971. In fact, you made a very solemn promise. You said, I am so confident that the company will be in profit within 12 months that if it is not, I will happily hand over the reins. Yes. Well, that was written in the heat of the... Uh, the heat of the moment. Uh, the, well, the heat of the battle, I was going to say. And within 12 months, in fact, we were in profit. But you were not to know that on the night of March the 15th, were you, Mr. Porton? If that bridge had collapsed, that would be the end of your company. The fact is, madam, it did not collapse. I put it to you, Mr. Porton that the fear of losing control of your firm was foremost in your mind that night? No, madam. That the fear had been heightened earlier in the day when you'd been forced to admit that you were behind schedule? That when you reached the site and found that the bridge had not been linked up, you were panicked into demanding that this job be completed immediately and as an excuse you invented this so-called gale warning? Madam, I've never heard such a monstrous pack of... 
false assumptions in all my life. Unfortunately, your present status protects you from libel. But it's a freedom you grossly abuse. 